Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Day 1929, Georgia Tech played the University of California in the Rose Bowl. In that game, a man named Roy Regals recovered a fumble for California. Somehow, he became confused and started running 65 yards in the wrong direction. One of his teammates, Benny Lom, outdistanced him and downed him just before he scored for the opposing team. When California attempted to punt, Tech blocked the kick and scored a safety, which was the ultimate margin of victory. That strange play came in the first half, and everyone who was watching the game was asking the same question. What will Coach Nibs Price do with Roy Regals in the second half? The men fouled off the field and went into the dressing room. They sat down on the benches and on the floor, all but Regals. He put his blanket around his shoulders, sat down in a quarter, corner, put his face in his hands, and he cried like a baby. Although Coach Price usually had a great deal to say to his team during halftime, that day Coach Price was quiet. No doubt he was trying to decide what to do with Regals. Then the timekeeper came in and announced that there were three minutes before playing time. Coach Price looked at the team and said simply, Men, the same team that played the first half will start the second. The players got up and started out, all but Regals. He did not budge. The coach looked back and called to him again. Still, he didn't move. Coach Price went over to where Regals sat and said, Roy, didn't you hear me? The same team that played the first half will start the second. Then Roy Regals looked up and said, Coach, I've ruined the University of California. I've ruined myself. I couldn't face that crowd in the stadium to save my life. Then Coach Price reached out, put his hand on Regal's shoulder, and said to him, Roy, get up and go on back. The game is only half over. And Roy Regal's went back, and those tech men will tell you that they have never seen a man play football as Roy Regal's played that second half. Many have run the wrong way in life, and like Jonah, have been wrong way regals. But when the grace of God gets hold of a life, many have turned their lives around and they live for the Lord with a full effort in all that they have. The Apostle Paul is a great example of that. He was running away from the Lord, persecuting believers in the kingdom church. But when God's grace got a hold of Paul, he turned his life around and ran the course of the Christian life with extraordinary passion and zeal. After running the wrong way from the Lord, Jonah got turned back around by the Lord to go to Nineveh. But his attitude and prejudice didn't get turned around right away. Jonah had a lot of unlearning to do. And it took time for God to deal with his hard-heartedness. And in that, we learn that for those who run away from the Lord, it's easy to get off the right path, and it's easy to get away quickly. But often, like Jonah, there's a slow recovery, and the road back can be very difficult and painful. Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 read, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cry by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. 
When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. In chapter 1, we learned how Jonah went down to the seaport of Joppa. After paying the fare to go to Tarshish, he then went down into the ship. To make the storm stop, at Jonah's request, the sailors cast him into the sea, and down into the sea he went. And there a great fish was awaiting him, and swallowed Jonah, and he went down into its belly, and then the fish took him down deeper into the sea. It was down, 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 down. Every step out of the will of God is a downward step. No one ever disobeyed God and went up. You only go down, down, down. The great storm on the Mediterranean Sea stopped Jonah from going to Tarshish. After he was thrown from the ship carrying him to Tarshish, a great fish swallowed him, and Jonah was in the belly of that fish three days and three nights. The Bible's most famous fish story, which has been the target of skeptics for hundreds of years, was confirmed by the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who himself had prepared the great fish. But the truth and reality of this account is confirmed by the highest authority of all. And the Lord taught how this account pictured his burial and resurrection from the dead. So not only was this miracle confirmed by the highest authority there is, Jesus Christ, this miracle prefigured the greatest miracle of all, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Lord said in Matthew 12, verse 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Chapter 2 records a prayer of Jonah during his time in the belly of the whale. And we see the trust of the prophet in his God throughout the prayer. In verse 2, Jonah cries to the Lord out of the belly of hell, or Sheol, or the grave is what the word Sheol refers to. This does, this does not necessarily mean that Jonah died, but that he likens his situation in the completely dark and rank stomach of a fish to being in a grave, or in a, in a tomb. In verse 3, even though the sailors had cast him into the sea, Jonah sees that it was ultimately the Lord who had placed him there. And he describes how he is in the midst of the deep sea, compassed by water with billows and waves above and passing over him. In verse 4, even though he's in a hopeless situation inside the belly of the fish in the deep sea, in faith, he expresses hope, and he fully expects deliverance, as he expects to once again look upon the temple in Jerusalem. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. The Historical Beginning of the Church is a 60-page booklet written by Pastor Paul M. Sadler. This booklet is a journey through the Book of Acts to determine when the Church, the Body of Christ, began historically. Christendom, for the most part, believes the birthday of the Church took place on the day of Pentecost. However, as you will see, this view is weighed in the balance and found wanting. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, 
call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. In verse 5, Jonah vividly describes how seaweed was wrapping itself around his head in the fish's belly, and how in the belly of the fish, how waters were rushing in, in and all around him. In verse 6, Jonah again speaks of the depths of the sea and how helpless he was to deliver himself and being at the bottom of the sea. The great mass of water around and above him seemed to shut and bolt the door of any hopes of seeing the earth again as far as any effort of his own to make that happen. So he expresses hopelessness, but then he hopes in the Lord, and he fully expects deliverance from the corruption which his body would experience in death if the Lord did not rescue him. And when he had reached the deepest point of despair, Jonah says that I remembered the Lord, and he was comforted through prayer and the Word of God. In verse 8, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercies. Lying vanities refers to false gods, idols, any worthless, helpless, powerless object or thing. You could also be referring to self and to selfish pride. Paul says that those who worship these false gods or place their trust in themselves, that these are lying vanities, lying things that are empty, and that they literally forsake their own mercy, or they forsake God, the God of mercy. They forsake the loving kindness and mercy of God, which they could experience in their life if they trusted Him. And we see through this, that through that verse and that prayer, Jonah was learning to move toward God and not away from him in his life because Jonah was especially guilty of this verse. He had forsaken his own mercy by trying to flee from the Lord. In verse 9, Jonah erupts into praise and thanksgiving in his prayer in anticipation of sure deliverance and vows to obey his commission to go to Nineveh. At the end of chapter 2, we find Jonah doing the same things as the sailors in chapter 1, offering a sacrifice, or a sacrifice of thanksgiving in the case of Jonah in the whale, in the whale and vowing a vow. Since Jonah was in a completely helpless and hopeless state, completely dependent upon the Lord for deliverance, he learned what the end of verse 9 says, Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah learned this sentence of good theology in a very strange college. He learned it in the whale's belly, at the bottom of the mountains of the, the depths of the sea, with weed, seaweed wrapped around his head and water rushing in all around him. The only way Jonah was going to be saved and delivered out of his helpless situation was by the Lord. And it's the exact same thing for all of us, for us to be saved from our sins. We cannot save ourselves out of the bondage and penalty of our sins. We are helpless. We each have to come to the same realization as Jonah in order to be saved and delivered from our sins and to be delivered from the second death of the lake of fire that salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is the work of God. It is He alone who saves. It's him, He alone who gives life to the soul that is dead in trespasses and sins. We are saved by the Lord's mercy and grace and what He did for us at the cross. Like Jonah could do nothing to save himself out of the fish's belly, we can do nothing whatsoever to save ourselves out of being in our sins and on our way to judgment. We must just trust the Lord that He died for our sins and rose again. And when we do, He immediately saves us because salvation is of the Lord completely. 
After Jonah personally experienced the Lord's salvation and being delivered out of the fish's belly, Jonah now was prepared to preach the Lord's salvation in Nineveh. In verse 10, the dry land upon which Jonah was vomited out onto most likely was back in Joppa, right back where the boat for Tarshish had left. And his deliverance, which he had trusted in the Lord to do for him, was now fully realized. And in this vomiting out in the dry land of Jonah, we learn the moral of the story about Jonah and the whale. You can't keep a good man down. Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10 read, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Jonah is given a second chance, and he obeys this time. Upon coming to the massive city, Jonah entered the city and moved steadily through it, proclaiming the message of God's impending judgment and their need for repentance. Upon hearing Jonah's message, word spread like wildfire. A fast was proclaimed and a decree was published. And the result was that the people of Nineveh believed God, verse 5 says. And that is how anyone is saved, taking God at His word believing the message that he has revealed for how to be saved. Under grace, that message is to trust that Christ died for your sins and rose again. The whole city, from the king on down, turned to God, gave evidence of grief over their sins by fasting and mourning, and they turned from their sins, all 600,000 of them in this huge city. The 40-day period before the judgment took place, within God's message uh, from Jonah, shows you God's willingness and His desire that all of them repent. These facts with the fact of a prophet sent by God to warn them stirred the Ninevites and their response to Jonah's message was genuine and without delay. And as a result of the repentance and belief of the Ninevites, God relented of the judgment that He was going to bring upon the city. On the basis of their change in attitude towards him in faith and obedience to Jonah's message, God dealt mercifully with Nineveh. They turned from their evil ways and then he turned from his fierce anger. Now you would think that the book would end right here on this high note and you would expect that the single greatest revival in history would bring absolute joy to the one who bore the message to them. But this is Jonah we're talking about here. Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 11 read, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, 
for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning arose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. And then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in the night. And should, I not, should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. Instead of being pleased and praising God for his mercy to Nineveh, Jodah was displeased exceedingly and very angry. That very angry means hot. He was hot with anger. The Lord had shown Jonah mercy in being delivered from the fish, after his repentance and change of heart and mind. But Jonah selfishly wasn't willing for Nineveh to be shown mercy after their change of heart and mind. So Jonah prays to the Lord and expresses how his view had not changed from when he had fled to Tarshish. He did not want to go to Nineveh in the first place because he knew that the Lord was gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and exceedingly kind. Jonah here is quoting Joel 2, verse 13, verbatim, and he treats God's goodness as if it were something bad. Jonah did not want those Ninevites saved. He wanted them judged, and that's human nature. Human nature enjoys seeing people get what's coming to them. Jonah shows how far his thinking was from God's. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God does not delight in the death of the wicked, and Jonah should not have either, and neither should we. We should want all people to be saved, as God does. Jonah was so distraught over the Ninevites' deliverance that he begs God to take his life. He had praised God for delivering him. Now he asks God to kill him. God shows incredible patience with Jonah. We can be glad that he does that with us too. Patiently, God asks him, if he had any good reason or grounds to be angry? And the answer was no. But Jonah gives no answer in reply. Jonah then goes out east of Nineveh, makes himself a booth or a temporary shelter or hut of branches and leaves. And Jonah sits there waiting and hoping that since the 40 days had not yet elapsed, perhaps there would be a change in God's purpose concerning the city. Maybe God would still judge Nineveh, and then he'd have a ringside seat to watch it happen. God proceeds to teach Jonah about the narrowness of his heart. As the Lord had prepared a great fish, he now prepares a gourd for Jonah. He caused a large leafy plant to grow rapidly and provide Jonah with shade from the blazing sun. Jonah was exceedingly angry at the beginning of this chapter, and now at this point, he, because of his comfort, he was exceedingly glad. But the Lord also had prepared a worm to come and attack the fast-growing plant the next morning so that it would wither and deprive Jonah of the shade he was enjoying. 
Then to add to his mercy, misery, the Lord sends a sultry, scorching east wind with brought oppressive heat and dust, and all this made Jonah again wish to die. So God asks him again, you have good reason to be angry, Jonah? And this time he answers, and he answers, yes, that he had every right to be angry, even to the point of death. And then God rebukes him sharply in verses 10 and 11. And he rebukes him for having more concern for a gourd, a plant, a temporal comfort, a short-lived soulless plant, while he had no concern over the eternal destiny of 600 thousand souls in Nineveh. Jonah grieved over a plant which he had no part in planting or helping to grow while those Ninevites were the work of God's hand. Thus God had every right to show mercy, kindness, and concern for them and to spare them when they repented. One commentator said this, the gourd was quite temporal and was of little value, yet Jonah grieved over it. Jonah's affections were distorted. He cared more for a plant than for human lives. He cared more for his personal comfort than for the spiritual destiny of thousands of people. Jonah had thought God was absurd in sparing the Assyrians. God exposed Jonah as the one whose thinking was absurd. Oh, we might shake our heads at Jonah. He's convicting to each of our hearts because it is easy for each of us to be just like them and to be more concerned about our temporal personal comfort in life than the eternal destiny of souls around us in life. The way that the book ends seems discouraging as the prophecy ends with the prophet in discouragement and under God's reproof, but it needs to be remembered again that Jonah was obviously the writer of the book. And we see that he had been humbled and had learned from the error of his ways and his thinking because the book in every way magnifies God in his mercy and kindness and in every way demeans the prophet who wrote the book. And in that we see that Jonah had learned his lesson. Now, have we learned lessons from this book? May we apply them to our lives and be transformed by grace. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www. BereanBibleSociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750 or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society P.O. Box 756 Germantown, Wisconsin 53022 Now until next time may you be transformed by God's grace <laughs>